Agradeço a presença de vocês e do professor Noan Elcoat. O professor Noan Elcoat leciona na Universidade de Colômbia, no Departamento de História da Arte e Arqueologia. É editor de uma das revistas hoje mais prestigiadas dessas relações entre arte, mídia, política e arquitetura. É uma revista muito importante, chamada Grey Room. Uh, Noan tem se dedicado a pesquisas sobre as pesquisas, sobretudo em torno das vanguardas, né, do período entre guerras, né, uh, e está para publicar pela Universidade de Chico, pela editora da Universidade de Chicago um primeiro livro so, sobre uma teorização e historicização sobre a construção artificial da escuridão, desde os trabalhos de Wagner até trabalhos na vanguarda do período entre guerras. Uh, o tema, o espectro cinematográfico, dialoga diretamente com as pesquisas do Noan Elcourt, né, um território que ele tem explorado muito, essa questão de pensar o filme, como a gente tem visto né, desde o primeiro desde a primeira fala do Felipe Lamichaud, e, sem mais delongas, eu passo a palavra para ele, já reiterando né, o agradecimento pela presença de vocês e a presença do Noan Elkult. Obrigado. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you also uh, for your patience, as uh, the talk is in English. I have no Portuguese, so I appreciate very much um, your patience and, of course, the help of the translator. Um, thank you to the uh, uh, Tamar and the staff uh, for this invitation, and above all, uh, thank you to Tadeo Capistrano uh, for organizing this incredible lecture series. Um, as I said to him, these are all of the people I would want to hear speak, uh, so I'm honored to be part of it as well. Thank you. The uh, talk tonight is in six sections. It runs about one hour uh, and includes some, uh, some great video uh, toward the end of the talk, not all of which, believe it or not, is available on YouTube, or at least not that I know of. So I hope there's some treats for all of us. <clears throat> Beyond good and bad objects, for the last 40 years, art criticism and to a lesser extent, avant-garde film criticism has been mired in a series of binaries inherited from a particularly potent blend of 1970s theory. Some combination of minimalism's emphasis on the body and phenomenology, post-minimalism's -minimal exploration of process and institutional critique, and apparatus film theory's constitution of a cinematic subject has divided the world into good and bad objects. Materiality is good, immateriality is bad. Embodiment is good, disembodiment is bad. Active participation is good, passive spectatorship is bad. Real space is good, illusionistic space is bad. More broadly, reality is good and illusions are bad. Demystification is good, but mystification is bad. Avant-garde art is good, and Hollywood film is bad. The problems with these schematic binaries are legion, philosophical, historical, political, technical, and least of all, and not least of all, uh, terminological. Yet critics have perpetuated the illusion of perceptual illusion and ideological mystification by adhering to the der derogatory omnibus phantasmagoria. So phantasmagoria is the word we use to describe all the things we hate. Indeed, it may very well be this pejorative designation that has blinded critics and historians to a crucial quality of so much recent art and media, a quality we can name without judgment, but with renewed media archeological vigor, phantasmagoric. Although somewhat marginal in the long history of cinema, the phantasmagoric, and I want to define this very specifically, is the phantasmagoric is the assembly of humans and images in a common space. 
So phantasmagoria is the gathering of spirits, of phantasms, and I'm using it in a very technical sense of humans and images occupying one in the same space. Phantas the phantasmagoric plays an outsized role in film and video art installations of the last half century and figures ever more prominently in our daily interactions with media. That is, our predominantly mediated interactions with each other, ourselves, and our world. I'd like to advance the phantasmagoric as a condition, or I'll use the technical term dispositif, the phantasmagoric as a dispositif that functions between the reductive binaries with which I open the talk. So between materiality and immateriality, between embodiment and disembodiment, between active participation and passive spectatorship and so forth. Along the way, I hope to restore some historicity to the two poles of the reductive binaries and challenge the ontological and judgmental claims that have, inha that have inhibited our capacity to think through the multiplicity of cinematic locations over the last few hundred years. But before we dig into the past, let's situate ourselves in the present. In 2006, philosopher Giorgio Agamben presciently theorized the cell phone as a dispositif, a techno-political apparatus that was reconfiguring the human subject. A year later, and with much less philosophical ambition or rigor, New Yorker film crit critic David Denby reported from the front lines of the media industrial complex. And he recognized in the video iPod, you may remember this old device, quote, a new platform for movies, a new convenience that will annihilate old paradigms. Now that smartphones and tablet users number in the billions and multi-platform video technology has become as hegemonic as cinemas were in their heyday, the new convenience has, without a doubt, assumed the role of a dispositif. In Denby's account, the most damning news was an evaluation not of media technologies, but of media subjects, of the users. A new generation of cinema spectators, or more precisely, of media consumers. I quote, According to home entertainment specialists I spoke to in Hollywood, Denby writes, many kids are platform agnostic. That is, they will look at movies on any screen at all, large or small. Let's dwell for a moment on the phrase platform agnostic. It's a religious phrase, of course. Agnosticism means, invariably refers to God. For if Denby's target was a generation of viewers, kids, he adopted a description borrowed from software programming. Adobe Acrobat or Firefox, to cite two among innumerable examples, are platform agnostic in so much as they can run on any computer platform, be it Windows, Apple OS, Linux, what have you. The term migrated from computer platforms to much wider ranging media platforms, whereby cinema, television, desktops, laptops, tablets, smartphones, are all equally valid interfaces for the consumption of sounds and images by platform agnostics. Industry executives understood viewers, human beings, in terms of software and devices. Today, one is hard pressed to find a commercial campaign, let alone a movie, that is not cross-platform, that is, whose content is not platform agnostic. Platform agnosticism, the capacity to deliver media content across multiple platforms, became the creed of software engineers, advertisers, politicians, organizers, and corporate media gurus. The backlash against platform agnosticism came swiftly. Companies are encouraged to, by some to focus on their core platforms, and much more relevant to us, film and art theorists are evangelizing with renewed vigor the gospels of materiality, specificity, and essentialism. That is, a willful blindness to the apocal change unfolding around us. Cinema studies or art history, we are often told, 
must be saved from the perdition of media and visual studies. Celluloid, others preach, must not only be preserved, but upheld against video and digital pretenders. A third claim, the one that interests me most today, pertains to the location, place, site, or more expansively yet precisely, the dispositif of cinema. Among the most passionate spokesmen for the essential primacy of the cinematic dos dispositif is the great French film theorist and art critic, Raymond Bellour. I quote a recent essay. This is Raymond Bellour writing. I begin with the simple hypothesis, but one involving infinite detours. The lived, more or less collective experience of a film projected in a cinema in the dark, according to an unalterably precise screening procedure, remains the condition for a special memory experience, one from which every other viewing situation more or less departs. This supposes a certain rule of faith of which the spectator would be the incarnation in the unfolding of a liturgy associated with film, with cinema, and with film in the cinema situation." End quote. Bellot counters platform agnosticism with an article of cinematic faith, a liturgy of film, a hypothesis with infinite detours, all of which, however, follow the same straight belief or orthodoxy. The failure of this orthodoxy is not its insistence on the specificity of the cinematic dispositif. I agree with that. But the pronouncement of its timeless primacy, that is the condition uh, that is, is asserting it as the condition from which every other viewing situation more or less departs. Where platform agnostics are, willing, are willfully ignorant of dispositifs and reduce cinema and other media to mere content, platform zealots, like Bellur, are willfully ignorant of the historical contingency of movie theaters and hypostasize classical theatrical cinema into a medium-specific essence. The art historian Jonathan Crary has recently encapsulated the matter, of, the matter as follows, and I quote again, this is another long quotation. Cinema, as a technological form, appeared to consist of some relatively fixed elements and relations from the late 1920s into the 1960s or even early 1970s. Television in the US seemed to have a material and experiential consistency from the 1950s into the 1970s. These periods in which certain key features seemed to be permanent allowed critics to expound theories of cinema. <coughs> These periods, let's try again. These periods in which key features seemed to be permanent allowed critics to expound theories of cinema, television, or video based on the assumption that these forms or systems had certain essential self-defining characteristics. In retrospect, what were most often identified as essential were temporary elements of larger constellations whose rates of change were variable and unpredictable. Just to summarize that, Crary is arguing that cinema was stable for a very brief period, from the 20s to maybe the 70s. And television was stable from maybe the 50s to the 70s. And it's precisely in that moment, in the 1960s and 70s, that theorists claimed an ontology for each of those media, the ontology of cinema or the essence of television. And he says that whole enterprise is nonsense. In regard to Bellot's and other faith-based faith essentialist articulations of specificity, we can do no better than follow Marx's directive, borrow from St. Matthew the Evangelist, and let the dead bury their dead. Our charge as historians and theorists is to recover and conceptualize the stark variabilities and unexpected continuities in these larger media constellations, a task wholly abandoned by platform agnostics and platform zealots alike. Both zealots and agnostics render history and politics irrelevant. One does so by universalizing the cinematic condition into religion, the other by annulling it 
into content. Our charge, finally, is not to find the essence of cinema or delimit its specificity, but rather to conceptualize its multiplicity. In its long history, what is often described as its pre and post history, cinema has always engendered a multiplicity of sights and a multiplicity of images. Cinemas and film simply constituted the dominant iteration of the medium's classical period. But cinema is no more tied to movie theaters and celluloid than sculpture is bound to temples and marble. In a word, cinema will be multiple or it will not be at all. The multiplicity I will elaborate today revolves around dispositives in which moving images have thrived to varying degrees over the last few centuries. This typology advances from the media archaeological observation that certain types of images thrive best in certain types of locations and not in others. For the sake of simplicity, I will present a threefold multiplicity. Three media ecologies or dispositives that promote and inhibit specific types of images in specific types of locations. Each dispositif is internally multifaceted and externally porous to other dispositifs. Claims to their coherence and strict delineation are heuristic. But violations of these boundaries have real consequences, aesthetic, social, economic, perhaps even political. I will distinguish the three dispositives as follows. First, the cinematic. Second, room space. And the third, the phantasmagoric. I will conclude with an extended analysis of the phantasmagoric in art, film, and popular culture. But first, some quick and rough histories and definitions of all three dispositives. The, cin the cinematic is, emblematic, is an emblematic instance of what Joachim Pech has described as the experience of proximity affected through distance. So we experience, it's the experience of nearness or proximity because we're actually at a distance. So in the cinema, we're absorbed in the image because we're absolutely removed from it. I'll elaborate in a second. But crucial, the cinematic wasn't born with the cinema. The cinematic is a 19th century construction as I'll argue, and early cinema from the first decade wasn't cinematic in the sense I'm arguing here. It's not until the 19, late 10, uh, late of the, in, basically it wasn't until the 19 teens that cinema becomes, and the cinematic dispositif merge. Cinema places us in the film by displacing us from the auditorium. In Rudolf Harms' striking 1926 formulation in his text, the philosophy of film, the cinema, he writes, should guarantee the highest degree of bodily detachedness and seek to alleviate the shortcomings of the individual's fixed and local bondedness. So in the cinema, we have to get rid of our bodies and we have to forget about the space. Crucially, cinema as an architecture, a system, or a dispositif that affects proximity through distance arose wholly independent of film. As Jonathan Crary contends, radical spatial dislocation and separation constituted one of the core qualities of 19th century attractions. We see here the panorama. I quote, forms as seemingly different as Daguerre's diorama, v Wagner's theater at Bayreuth, the Kaiser panorama, the kinetoscope, and of course, cinema, as it took shape in the late 1890s, are, alongside the panorama, other key 19th century examples of the image as an autonomous luminous screen of attraction, whose apparitional appeal is an effect of both its uncertain spatial location and its detachment from a broader visual field. Amidst the panorama, diorama, Kaiser panorama, kinetoscope, and other attractions from the long 19th century, Wagner's theater at Bayreuth was unique on two separate accounts. And just as a reminder, Wagner built this theater in 1876. He inaugurated it, and crucially for our purposes, it's the model on which all cinemas are built. Uh, 
in uh, Friedrich Kittler's wonderful formulation, uh, it is to the darkness of Bayreuth that all cinematic darkness dates. Wagner's theater at Bayreuth was unique on two separate counts. First of all, it was universal. The panorama, diorama, Kaiser panorama, and kinetoscope were proprietary structures built for the exhibition of specific types of images. Note the frequent proper nouns and patents. The Kaiser panorama, just to go back, the Kaiser panorama, a late 19th century device that enabled up to 25 individuals to view a, a series of stereoscopic images, could not display panorama paintings which measured thousands of square meters any more than a diorama, which could exhibit any more than a diorama could exhibit the 35 millimeter film strips that ran through the kinetoscope, Edison's early cinematic peep show device. The exhibition structure required specific technical images, and the images required specific technical exhibition structures. Right? You needed a specific uh, device to see uh, 35 millimeter film, just like you needed a specific architecture to see a di diorama painting. Wagner's Festspielhaus, by contrast, was a model theater that could accommodate countless types of performances and images. Indeed, its most significant legacy was its adoption by cinemas, that is, as a support for a medium as yet unrealized in 1876. Second, Wagner theorized spectatorial displacement more radically than any other 19th century figure. His essay, The Artwork of the Future, became this touchstone, direct and indirect, for countless 20th century theories of cinema. And I'm quoting Wagner from 1849. In the arrangement of the space for the spectators, the need for optical and acoustic understanding of the artwork will give the necessary law. Thus, the spectator transplants himself upon the stage by means of all of his visual and oral faculties, while the performer becomes an artist only by complete absorption into the public. The public, that representative of daily life, disappears from the auditorium completely and lives and breathes now only in the artwork which seems to it as life itself and on the stage which, which seems the wide expanse of the whole world." End quote. Wagner's turn of the century English translator, William Ashton Ellis, could not equal Wagner's temerity and wrote instead that the public forgets the confines of the auditorium rather than disappears, verschwindet, from the auditorium. But viewed retrospectively from the rise of cinemas, disappearance was not too strong a word. Biat Wies channels Wagner's ambitions from the perspective of film palaces. I'm quoting this wonderful essay by Biat Wies. The public exists exclusively for the work of art, and in the auditorium as a corpus, it is literally extinguished. Here, it is pitch black, so that the stage light can shine all the more brightly. In the strictest sense, the tiered theater was succeeded by the cinema auditorium rather than the modern theater. So that the appearance of the projected image can reign, the empirical being of the spectator must be extinguished. And I'm showing you repeatedly uh, Sugimoto's wonderful theater series, with which I'm sure you're familiar, among the many details that are remarkable. Um, as you probably know, the photograph, uh, he opens the shutter at the beginning of a film screening and closes it only at the end of the film screening. So all of the light you see is the light bouncing off of the screen. And the screen is white because all of the frames together cancel themselves out into pure whiteness. Among the beautiful elements of uh, this series is that in his theater of movie theaters, the audience disappears. This illusion of proximity, counterintuitively achieved through distance, through absolute separation, would later find its perfect inversion in Walter Benjamin's definition of aura as, quote, the unique appearance or semblance of a distance, no matter how close it may be. 
If aura was that which withered in the age of technological reproducibility, as Benjamin famously argued, that age can be defined in part as the technological production of the illusion of proximity, an illusion perfected in the cinema, but whose origins reach back well into the 19th century. Proximity affected through distance is the hallmark of cinema as a dispositif. Cinematic immersion necessitates the displacement of spectators from their environment. It is a question of architecture, industrial, and avant-garde. And just again, to summarize the point, this cinematic, as I want to define it, whether it's in the diorama, the panorama, in Wagner's Festspielhaus in Bayreuth, or in cinemas from the 19-teens to the present, the essence of the cinematic dispositif is that we're absolutely separated from the image. We forget about ourselves, we forget about our bodies, and because we cease to exist, we're absorbed into the film. So we're brought closer to the image because our own space and our own bodies are negated. Room space. I borrow the term room space from the art historian T.J. Clark, who made it the centerpiece of his recent book on Picasso and truth. As the figuration of bourgeois society at the end of bourgeois society, that is, as the afterlife of the 19th century in, 20th, in the 20th century, room space makes no serious claims on cinema or media space of any kind. According to Clark, room, room space partakes of the high art of Europe and the United States in the, in the 20th century. It embodies above all the achievements of painting and represents a private dream world rather than a direct confrontation with the horrors of the 20th century. Room space, in other words, should be completely useless or even retrograde for students of technological media. And yet its utility for our discussion lies precisely in its willful ignorance of immersive media spaces and their importance for visual modernity. Room space, in other words, I'm sorry. Room space is the 19th century salon which harbored phenakistoscopes, praxinoscopes, and other optical toys that featured moving images as well as their descendants in modern art. And I show you a number of wonderful images, um, these by the recently deceased Robert Breer. These are reconstructions of late 19th, early 20th century optical toys as works of art. Room space is the middle class living room where television made its home, first as furniture, later as hearth. Room space is the dormitories, tract housing, and Mick mansions littered with computers, tablets, phones, and other devices for the consumption of media content, not least, though quite nearly least, movies. Room space is the ever-increasing number of galleries from the 1960s to the present in which altered television sets by Nam Joon Paik, Baroque celluloid loops by Simon Starling, and the cinematic and videographic sculptures of countless others found quarters and eventually buyers. In room space, cinema is an optical toy, a piece of furniture, a book, a sculpture, in a word, an object. Accordingly, it is placed among other objects. Crucial is that devices like televisions do not create the same sense of placelessness as cinema. As media theorist Anna McCarthy argues, quote, the idea that, telev that the television apparatus is itself an encroaching force of placelessness is a flawed, dangerously fetishistic one. The language of placelessness makes us forget that television is an object, and like all objects, it shapes its immediate space through its material form." End quote. What's more, room space cinema is an object that, like nearly all capitalist objects, is made to be bought and sold. Room space houses commodities. In room space, cinema finds a place as a commodity. Its vernacular form ranges from toys to televisions and other ele electronic or digital gadgets. Its, culturally, its culturally exalted form we call 
artworks. A third dispositif emerges uncomfortably between cinematic and room space. It is less familiar, but by no means less important to contemporary spectators and viewers. I call this dispositif phantasmagoric. The name, no doubt, invites the wrath of Marxist critics, but it's high time we abandon sweeping condemnations that reduce the world to good and bad objects or techniques. Art and politics are more complicated than all that. And our refusal to recognize the phantasmagoric in much contemporary production, whether popular or elite, has left us ill-equipped to address these spaces between cinema and objects. So what is the phantasmagoric? Let's begin with what it was. Coined at the end of the 18th century, the phantasmagoria, as its name announced, assembled ghosts. Whether assuming the form of the bloody nun, Medusa, the devil, or that of recently deceased leaders like Louis XIV or Robespierre, these ghosts were first and foremost mediated images. They were technically painted lantern slides. Phantasmagoric images were projected on visible smoke, and you can see on the image on the right, uh, the smoke, the image is projected directly onto smoke, or invisible screens suspended in dark spaces. The images were unmoored from their material supports and occupied the same dark space as spectators. The original phantasmagorias were developed by enlightened showmen and duplicitous necromancers like Johann Schröpfer, Paul Philidor, and most famously, Etienne Gaspard Robertson. You may have heard more about the phantasmagoria from my colleague Stefan Andriopoulos, who was here just a few weeks ago, and has a wonderful book on ghosts that tackles the phantasmagoria in philosophy that's just been published by Tadeo in a Portuguese translation. The most important descendants of the phantasmagoria was the mid-19th century attraction named Pepper's Ghost, after the rational entertainer John Henry Pepper, a longtime lecturer and honorary director of London's Polytechnic Institution. John Henry Pepper reaped a fortune from the ghost, but he invented none of the elements in the device that would eventually bear his name. The ghost's seminal features were invented by a, a, a figure forgotten by history named Henry Dirks, and they derived, as, the, as suggested by Dirks's preferred designation, he called it the Dirksian phantasmagoria. Right? Fundamentally, it was a version of phantasmagoria. And again, it's going to be the assembly of humans and ghosts and images in the same space. To be all too brief, Pepper's ghost, or the Dirksian phantasmagoria, comprised a giant slanted pane of glass and you see it here especially on the diagram on the right. A giant slanted pane of glass placed on stage such that an unawares audience could peer through the glass to the action on the stage and simultaneously see in a reflection in the glass of an actor in the wings or below. So in the uh, image, in the top image, importantly, uh, the actor on stage can't see the ghost. The ghost is only reflected in the glass. And the audience isn't aware that there's a glass uh, plate, a glass, uh, a glass sheet on the stage and sees the actor and the ghost side by side. By the end of the century, various cabarets presented variants on Pepper's ghosts where spectators could enter a coffin and as witnessed by the remaining audience members transform into a skeleton. Pepper's ghost was briefly fused with cinema in attractions such as Oscar Mester's Kinoplasticon, it was called, patented in 1910, variants of which were known as Alabastra and Tanagra. The technique is currently enjoying a strange revival under the erroneous rubric of holography. So every time you read about a hologram, it's not. It's actually Pepper's Ghost. Pepper's Ghost 
has attained spectacular successes, including a 2012 concert where Snoop Dogg and others performed on stage alongside Tupac Shakur. Now, for the non-rap connoisseurs in the room, myself among them, I remind you that Tupac was murdered in 1996, 17 years or 16 years before he appeared on stage with Snoop Dogg. Earlier this year, Michael Jackson was resurrected at the Billboard Music Awards to perform a new song and appear on stage in phantasmagoric fashion. In each case, uh, a new variant of Pepper's Ghost, a new uh, proprietary patented version of Pepper's Ghost was used to integrate live actors or singers and video images at the same time. Over the course of 220 years, we've exchanged Robespierre and the Revolution for Tupac and hip hop, the slayer of kings for the king of pop, but the techno-spatial configuration of the phantasmagoria, that is the phantasmagoric dispositif, has remained surprisingly stable. In phantasmagoria, there is no radical separation between images and spectators. That, as we know, is the domain of the cinematic. Nor are the images contained within objects, as in room space. In the original 18th century phantasmagorias and their contemporary descendants, humans and images are assembled in a common space. Whether these humans are credulous dupes or highly trained actors is of little consequence. Phantasmagorias are highly effective. We need not believe in ghosts to perceive phantasmagoric images. But phantasmagorias are also highly precarious. Here, cinema is strategically emplaced like a weapon to be deployed with unerring precision or risk exposure and failure. Phantasmagoria is a matter of performance or more broadly theater where live and, mediate, and, live and mediated images can assemble. Section four. We have three key operations. Displacement in the case of cinema. The spectators are displaced from the cinema. Placement in room space, cinema is placed within objects. And finally, emplacement. In the phantasmagoria, cinema is emplaced strategically into spaces where images and viewers can cohabitate. Displacement, placement, emplacement, but not replacement. Cinema is not replaced by the phantasmagoria, it is emplaced therein. Nor is it replaced by television or tablets, it is placed in room space. As this porosity or flu fluidity attests, the division between displacement, placement, and emplacement are not quite as neat as this terminological triumvirate might suggest. And yet certain qualities are immediately evident in each category. If time allowed, we could discuss time as well. Instead, let's quickly rehearse the respective features in regard to space and embodiment. Cinema negates spectatorial space, the better to allow images to work on the spectators. Room space consents to space, the better to preserve the object which houses the images. So in cinema, we forget about the space around us. In room space, it's every day. There's nothing special. Phantasmagoria reconfigures extant space, the better to fuse objects, spectators, and images. In the cinema, we tend to forget not only the surrounding space, but also our bodies. With Wagner, we remember, the public, that representative of daily life, disappears from the auditorium completely. Exceptional genres, pornography, say, or horror films that engage our bodies directly are just that, exceptions. And this is an advertisement for a 3D film, which is already somewhat phantasmagoric. Um, the ice pick is placed in a position so phallic, I'm not sure it demands any uh, further commentary. As we will see, these exceptions tend toward the phantasmagoric. Where bodily awareness is exceptional in the cinema, 
A cinematic sense of disembodiment is unlikely on a couch before a TV set, or with a smartphone or a fenachistoscope in your hand, or in a brightly or even dimly lit gallery. Here, in its quotidian observations rather than grandiloquent judgments, Michael Fried's famous critique of minimalism is trenchant. This is Michael Fried in his famous Art and Objecthood essay. He writes, right at the end, he writes, we are literalists most of our lives. Right? Minimalism is nothing special. It's every day. Right? And in some sense, he's right. It belongs to room space. They're just objects in space. If the cinema, according to Rudolf Harms, I quote again, if the cinema should guarantee the highest degree of bodily detachedness and seek to alleviate the shortcomings of the individual's fixed and local bondedness, then room spaces welcome couch potatoes, gallery goers, and other forms of quotidian and pathetic embodiment. It is phantasmagoria once again that poses the most unsettling form of spatiality and embodiment among the dispositifs in question. Here, we are often hyper aware of our bodies and surroundings. And just to use a commonplace example, in the cinema, we're not afraid of the dark. We're not even aware of the dark. Right? In a haunted house, the darkness is scary. We're hyper aware of it. In the cinema, we forget about our bodies. In a haunted house, you're hyper aware of your body, thinking that at any moment something might grab out come out and grab at you. Right? On one hand, the darkness disappears and makes your body disappear. In Phantasmagoria, you become hyper aware of your body and hyper aware of the darkness surrounding you. In a reversal of the cinematic, the phantasmagoric must guarantee the highest degree of image detachedness. That is, it must unmoor images from any material support, including screens, in order to enhance its local bondedness. The image isn't attached to anything, not to screens, not to television sets, not to anything. It is in our space. That's the essence of the phantasmagoric. The phantasmagoric image, in other words, cannot be perceived as trapped inside a device or on a screen, nor is absolutely divorced from the space we inhabit. Rather, the phantasmagoric image must occupy the same space we occupy. The Phantasmagoric Gallery. In the little time remaining me, I want to enter the art gallery to study works, canonical works and little known works, depending on one's frame of reference, whose phantasmagoric qualities are pronounced. In short, I want to put the theory of dispositives to the test. Commonplace critical writing on screen-based work tends to revert to the material-immaterial binary, which I enumerated earlier, and privilege and insistence on materiality. I quote from a recent book on the subject. Screens themselves have the curious status of functioning simultaneously as immaterial thresholds onto another space and time, and as solid material entities. The screen's objecthood, however, is typically overlooked in daily life. The conventional propensity is to look through media screens and not at them. According to this logic, which I'm arguing against, according to this logic, the fool or the dupe looks through. The critic, the enlightened critic, looks at. Now, what's... Uh, What's interesting is I'm not even sure that that holds true in the English language. We look at TV, we watch, we look at a screen, um, and we, when we, there's a, we can say it this way, we, uh, we, um, I'll leave the, uh, the speculative English uh, analysis for another time. Um, but I'm not even sure it works. I think we actually do look at, we now t we'll talk about looking at screens I'm spending all day looking at screens, as opposed to cinema, where uh, we look at cinema, we, we, anyway, okay, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm not sure that it works. The point is, in this reading, uh, looking at uh, is the critical enterprise, right? You see that it's merely a screen. Looking through and seeing what lies behind is what the fool does, 
if we're, we're fooled into looking through, we're enlightened when we look at. But as I've been arguing, the alternatives through and at do not correlate to different levels of enlightenment, but rather simply to different dispositives, cinema and room space. We stare through Wagner's double proscenium and perceive an optical hallucination on stage. We look at a TV or sculpture placed in an art gallery. This very opposition, however, forecloses a third mode of viewing that encourages simultaneously looking through and at the media screen. I have in mind, of course, the Dirksian phantasmagoria, that is, Pepper's Ghosts and its contemporary iterations. Right, the audience here looks through and at at the same time. They look through the glass screen to see the actor on stage. They look at the glass screen to see the image reflected from below. The phantasmagoric dispositif was foundational, I want to argue, for art in the 1960s and 70s. But because it emerged not from a single established practice like painting, film, or theater, but rather from the convergence of several practices, it has remained largely hidden in the historical record. Three exchanges are particularly pronounced. First, the expansion of cinema into performance, sculpture or installation, as evident in the expanded cinema movement and exemplified in the solid light films of Anthony McCall. The introduction, uh, second, the introduction of film and video into theater performances as perfected in the cinema pieces and theater works of Robert Whitman and carried forward by troops like the Worcester Group. I'll come back to these. And lastly, in the closed circuit video installations like those of Bill Viola or I think more compellingly, Peter Campus. The first two exchanges, that is expanded cinema and media-based theater, operate in different directions, opposite directions. Expanded cinema artists aimed to negate the virtuality of cinema with the reality of the projection event. Theater and performance artists, to the contrary, introduced cinematic illusions into the reality of the theatrical event. From antagonistic directions, both cinema and theater converged on the phantasmagoric as a mode to gather virtual images and real bodies in a shared space-time continuum. Video installation, above all closed circuit video with its real-time or delayed feedback, lent itself most readily to the phantasmagoric with effects that most closely approximate the historical phantasmagoria or Pepper's ghost. All three practices evince a collapse of the core oppositions that have undergirded so much post-war art and film theory. Again, materiality and immateriality, medium specificity and intermedia, and above all, reality and virtuality. McCall's expanded cinema aimed to abandon the virtuality of cinematic space and time in favor of real time and real space. Whitman's theater infused the real time space of performance with the virtual time space of cinema. Finally, Peter Campus's video installations, in his video installations, real time and real space can no longer be distinguished from virtual time and virtual space. We will address each phantasmagoric practice in turn. So these are three different models of phantasmagoria from the 60s and 70s. One is cinema entering reality, one is theater, inviting in the virtual, and the third is video installations. Right? And my argument is that these three practices have much more in common with each other than they do to cinema, theater, or video alone. We might be tempted to call the phantasmagoric a new medium in the 1960s and 70s, but that's exactly what I want to avoid. Beginning with the now canonical uh, film, Line Describing a Cone, from 1973, Anthony McCall's solid light films comprise the projection of a two-dimensional geometric form through a misty and darkened space so that the beam of light is perceptible as a three-dimensional immaterial sculpture. And I hope people are familiar 
with uh, McCall's work. I'll jump forward for a second. You can see uh, a vertical, more recent vertical piece. The, the light assumes almost the material quality because of the smoke or the mist in the room. McCall himself has situated his practice at the intersection of film, sculpture, and drawing. Recent critics have framed his work as a, quote, radical co-articulation of film and sculpture, as Gilles Deleuze might have put it, rather than a dialectic developing leading, a dialectical development leading from sculpture to film, end quote. In the immediate context of post-minimalism, a radical co-articulation of film and sculpture was not only aesthetically, but also politically ambitious in terms of its assault on traditional cinema spectatorship. In McCall's famous 1974 statement, published about it, republished about a decade ago in the journal October, I'm quoting, it is the first, he's describing line describing a cone. It is the first film to exist solely in real three-dimensional space. It refers to nothing beyond this real time. Against spectatorial immobility, he argued for a viewer who can, indeed needs to, move around relative to the slowly emerging light form. What's more, again I quote, the viewer watches the film by standing with his or her back toward what would normally be the screen. So we turn our back to the screen to look at this three-dimensional form unfolding before our eyes. According to these cogent and brilliant statements, rehearsed more frequently today than at the time of their proclamation, McCall's solid light films negated core aspects of the cinematic experience. That is, they were understood in largely negative terms. And, and I want to emphasize this. We're hearing it's not cinema, or it's between cinema and sculpture. McCall is always read as being between two things, not one, not the other. But I think it's high time we read him positively, and not just negatively, not just reactively. In the long history of dispositives, the solid light films were and remain unambiguously phantasmagoric. On the left, on the right, you see a recent installation of line describing a cone. On the left, you see a 18th century text on how to create phantasmagoric projections. Both use magic lanterns to project images on smoke. Projections on smoke in, a dark, in darkened spaces that assemble humans and images in a common space and time. As Gunnar Schmidt argues in his study of projections on smoke, clouds, and mist, McCall's line describing a cone is, quote, a new combination of modern abstraction and pre-modern theatricality. 200 years and a host of social, political, epistemological, and aesthetic ruptures separate the original phantasmagorias from the film line describing a cone and his more recent vertical works. But the basic configuration of image and bodies of a collective time-space continuum and the experience of an immediate mediation belong neither to cinematic film nor to room space sculptures nor even to their co-articulation. Rather, it adheres to the dicta established in the phantasmagoria over 200 years ago. The establishment of techno-aesthetic precedent does not diminish the radicality of McCall's work. Quite the contrary, in light of the phantasmagoric dispositif, we can recognize in the work of Anthony McCall and others not only a reactive, negative relation to traditional artistic mediums like film and sculpture, but also a positive engagement with the struggles of contemporary mediated existence. For what was a minor attraction 200 years ago has become a generalized dispositif in our time. A second trajectory into the phantasmagoric is plotted by the work of Robert Whitman. Is Robert Whitman familiar here? Uh, he was a key figure in avant-garde art and theater in the 1960s and 70s. Um, a, a few of his works have become, I think, canonical. Uh, the one I'm about to show you, or this one here, uh, uh, was in uh, 
was in the uh, famous exhibition in 2001 uh, curated by Chrissy Isles, Into the Light, at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, he's an amazing figure that's, who's unfortunately relatively unknown um, and deserves more attention. A second trajectory into the phantasmagoric is plotted by the work of Robert Whitman, who generally proceeded in the opposite direction from McCall, namely the introduction of cinema into sculpture and theater. Whitman's installations, sculptures, or as he called them, cinema pieces, are among the best known and most striking phantasmagoric works from the 1960s. In Shower, and this is the piece Shower, from 1964, to cite the locus classicus of phantasmagoric sculpture, a film of a woman, actually let me backtrack a second, uh, a film of a woman showering is projected inside of an operating shower, enclosed by a shower curtain and built into a wall of a dark space. So there's a fully functional shower in the gallery and the back of the shower is, you see the projection of a woman showering. So it's like classic trompe l'oeil. You're immediately fooled. The story is that during installation, someone opened the door, or one, of the, uh, one of the workers opened the door and got very nervous because he thought he was stumbling upon an actual woman right, taking a real shower. I'm sure that story is false, but it's a classic story surrounding all phantasmagoric projections. Now I'm gonna show you the film, but remember, in the real film isn't a standalone film. It's a film that you would see only behind the shower curtain, um, behind the shower curtain of, uh, of a functioning cinema, of a functioning uh, a shower, right? So you have to imagine this installed properly. The film image is back projected, like the original Phantasmagoria, such that the projection is doubly screened off from the viewer, first by the translucent screen on which it's projected, second by the translucent shower curtain. Whitman affects a collapse of illusion and reality as the composite image received by the viewer is produced by virtual images projected on the first screen and drops of real water projected on the second. As becomes clear relatively quickly, trompe l'oeil is hardly the objective. Instead, as you see, the full-length nude is replaced by an extreme close-up of the small of her back dripping with viscous liquid. A nearly invisible cut transforms the water into mist, all the better for a phantasmagoric performance. And again, imagine this behind a shower curtain with the shower actually on. Soon comes a close-up of the shower head, which ends any and all pretense to illusionism, where water is replaced by dark paint. As we return to the full length, as we return to the full length nude, who you'll, you'll see in a second, now dripping in paint and redolent of abstract expressionist technique, still very much in vogue, right? Jackson Pollard was famously dubbed Jack the Dripper. We have crossed the boundaries of sculpture, cinema, and painting. More precisely, we have toyed with the boundaries of the phantasmagoric, a dispositif that comfortably mobilizes multiple media in order to gather images and bodies in one and the same space and time. In Whitman's performance pieces, or in his preferred terminology, theater works, such as the most famous perhaps is prune, Prune Flat, oh, I'm gonna backtrack a second, uh, Prune Flat from 1965, the phantasmagoric is itself haunted, the double doubled, the spook spooked. And watch one more time. If you scrutinize the image properly, which is a very difficult task, you can recognize two separate projections. The first serves as a backdrop and is projected on a large screen. 
The second is a projection of the girl in various stages of dress and undress projected onto the black coat worn by a real woman who stands before the cinema screen. Right? That's how she can change, uh, how she can train, change outfits instantaneously. Here we have the near complete fusion of images and bodies executed with just enough precision to engender wonder. The operative term here indeed is wonder. Mystification and demystification hardly play a part. In retrospect, Whitman's case is an obvious one. His work has long been identified with the possible confusion between image and reality. That's Richard Constellance. Holographic-like effects, so there's that term holography by Gene Youngblood in expanded cinema. Holographic-like effects where images appear to float in three-dimensional space in real time. More recently, scholars and curators like Brandon Joseph and Lynn Cook have labeled Whitman's work phantasmagoric, though not in the technical sense advanced here. Whitman himself famously remarked, I quote, I've always been interested in ghosts and spirits and weird things. The genius of Whitman, and this is surely part of the bro broader legacy of surrealism, was to recognize ghosts and spirits in not only in weird things, but also in things at once quotidian and familiar on the one hand, and artistic and esteemed on the other. I am talking, of course, about the figure of women, whether fashionably dressed, undressed, or bathing, is of no consequence. Where cinema arrived at the phantasmagoric in pursuit of sculpture, and theater instantiated the phantasmagoric through the introduction of cinema, video leapt into the phantasmagoric territory the moment it made the entire room its object of inquiry, rather than reduce video to an image in a box. Exemplary, not least for its unintended proximity to 18th century phantasmagorias and all phantasmagoric attractions since, is the work of Bill Viola. A visitor to his 1988 installation, The Sleep of Reason, likely first, encountered, likely first encounters a wooden credenza atop of which sits a vase with flowers, a lamp, an alarm clock set to the actual time, and a black and white television monitor in which one sees a close-up of a man asleep. At irregular intervals, the room is plunged into darkness, save for the alarm clock, and large color moving images are projected on three walls, accompanied by loud and disquieting sounds. Here's a short video I took when I saw the installation in Paris uh, earlier this year. It wasn't the scariest moment, but I, I personally find it very peaceful. But other moments are scary, I assure you. Fires rage, dogs pounce, animals swim, waves crash on the beach, and owls tear out from the darkness. The owl and title, of course, are borrowed from Goya's etching, The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters, from 1799. That is, the exact same time Robertson perfected his own mon monsters in the original Phantasmagoria. Critics have dismissed the work, indeed, Viola's whole oeuvre, as a kitschy synthesis of haunted house tricks and ponderous ruminations on life and death. Rather than judge the work, though I am sympathetic to its critics, let us evaluate its phantasmagoric operations. On the one hand, there is a grainy, black and white, diminutive and nearly motionless image trapped in a box. That's the image we see you know, during the, the light sections. On the other hand, is the immersive and jarring seizure of the entire room in darkness too, as you see on the bottom. In the first instance, video is merely an object in room space, just like the lamp, the vase, and the alarm clock. In the second instance, room space is suspended in favor of a phantasmagoric space for terrifying images and terrified or at least entertained viewers. 
The one truly inspired touch in the installation is the bridge established by Viola between these two disparate dispositives. I'm thinking, of course, of the alarm clock. Unlike the table lamp or the room's illumination, the red glowing digits of the alarm clock never go black and never deviate from the actual time at the exhibition site. This real time, familiar to us from the huge international success of Christian Marclay's The Clock, this real time weaves room space and phantasmagoria, the quotidian and the oniric, into one space-time continuum. The supersession of an object-based conception of video art grounded in room space by a phantasmagoric articulation is also in evidence, albeit in much less melodramatic fashion, in a 1974 single channel video by Peter Campus. As Campus argued at the time, quoting, this is a, it's a very subtle video and the sound is also subtle. And this is a single channel video that would have been in a box. If we are to avoid the problem of creating a visual system that will reduce the capacity of the eye, it is necessary to disassociate the video camera from the eye and to make it an extension of the room. At the moment the room becomes an extension of the camera, here quite literally through blue screen techniques, room space yields to phantasmagoria. Thirty years later, campus would associate this collapse of monitor and room with a youthful obsession. I quote, when I was young, I made myself a prisoner of my room. It became part of me, an extension of my being. I thought of the walls as my shell. The room as a container had, a, this, had some relationship to the imaginary space inside a monitor. The relationship between the room as container and the imaginary space of video blossomed into a critical and contemplative articulation of the phantasmagoria, quite distinct from Viola's spectacular pomp. I'm going to skip a bit in the interest of time. Uh, Campus's primary contribution to phantasmagoric video lay in his pure pioneering video installations, where the single channel 1874 work illustrated a 1972 installation called Interface performed the very coincidence of looking through and at endemic to Pepper's ghost. And here is, a, on the left is Pepper's ghost, or a version of it. Uh, on the right is Peter Campus. Here, here the viewer enters a dark, empty room, save for a large plane of glass, a glass screen, which a video, with a video camera and projector on either side. As viewers approach the glass, they see a double reflection. The first is a traditional mirror image. The second is a real-time video captured through the glass by a camera on the far side. The double image hovers in the center of the gallery, suspended on a glass screen in what feels like real space and real time. Because the video projection corrects for the mirror's left-right reversal, it can appear like a truer double than the reflection a reflection let loose, a doppelganger, in a word, a ghost. Shadow Projection, a piece from 1974, performs the same ghost story, only with shadows instead of reflections. Interface and Shadow Projection are assemblies of shadows, reflections, and phantasms, in a word, phantasmagoria. Campus's video installations haunt the galleries they inhabit, this much is clear. But in a brilliant twist on the early modern dispositif, image and viewer not only inhabit a shared space and time, image and viewer, phantasm and self, become one and the same. I'm running a bit late, but this is my last section. The phantasmagoric present. In the 1970s and 80s, the technical challenges of phantasmagoria demanded total commitment on the part of artists. Today, the requisite techniques and technologies, the, uh, the requisite techniques and technologies are widely available and so can be employed sporadically or recurrently by artists and lay people as the occasion requires. Phantasmagoria still undergirds entire oeuvres for example, that of Tony Orsler. And here we have the influence machine projected on smoke. Um, it's a face projected on smoke that speaks. 
Um, not only does he project on smoke and, and steam, as in the original Phantasmagoria, but also on three-dimensional surfaces that collapse sculpture and cinema, that is, that become Phantasmagoria. More common, however, is the occasional turn to Phantasmagoria when the work and situation demand it. A few examples from across the worlds of art, cinema, architecture, theater, and dance will have to suffice to demonstrate the pervasiveness of Phantasmagoria. Indeed, once we're attuned to it, the Phantasmagoric is everywhere manifest, productively problematized or cynically spectacularized. A delirious sampling might include the works of Gary Hill, Stan Douglas, David Clairbout, or Rodney Graham's Torqued Chandelier release from 2005. This work and the projector, the custom-made projector, is in the same space. This work employs 35 millimeter film, 48 frames per second. That's the same high frame rate that was recently used for The Hobbit in 3D, uh, 35 millimeter film, 48, frame per, 48 frames per second, projection of a luminous image shot against and projected on a black screen to attain a hallucinatory clarity and phantasmagoric proximity, that is, the illusion of a shared space and time rather than the illusion of proximity affected through distance. And this is a high def, projection actually on a load on a, on a standard projector of a, uh, and it hardly does justice to seeing the work in 35 millimeter 848 frames per second in a gallery when you're in the gallery you, it looks like a chandelier is right there it is the most phantasmagoric experience of all of these that I've ever had the chandelier twirls one way and then back the other in an endless loop that is equal parts cinema pool and phantasmagoria. The worlds of theater and architecture are even more natural fits for phantasmagoria. For example, in 2005, in 2005, the Worcester Group, an avant-garde theater troupe, uh, staged a version of Hamlet, that ultimate ghost story, one which not surprisingly was performed in Pepper's theater using Pepper's ghost. The Worcester Group's Hamlet repurposed the live recording of Richard Burton's 1964 Broadway production. The Burton production was recorded live from 17 cameras and edited into a film that was shown as a special one-time event for only two days in nearly a thousand movie houses across the US. It's very similar to the Metropolitan Opera House's live in HD uh, broadcasts, which, are they in Brazil? Yeah, so a very similar type of thing um, 50 years prior. Theatro film, as it was called, was made possible through the miracle of electronovision. In the Worcester Group version, Actors and props frenetically move across the stage in order to keep pace with the rapid edits of, theatro, of the theatro, vision, uh, theatro film version. And what you see here are uh, live actors, and in the background is grainy footage from the original 1964 broadcast. So in the back is Richard Burton, in the front is Worcester Group actor. And the goal is that they're actually perfectly timed to one another. But in good Worcester Group fashion, they edited like two thirds of it out. So they're sometimes going. Where Robert Whitman introduced cinema into theater and arrived at Phantasmagoria, the Worcester Group creates theater from cinema in order to make visible the contours of our phantasmagoric present and past. Of course, the Worcester Group has limbed the boundaries of theater, cinema, video, and television, reality and virtuality, images and bodies for nearly four decades. Like Whitman, their entire oeuvre is in productive tension with the phantasmagoric. More surprisingly is the direct adoption of Pepper's Ghost, that is the Dirksian phantasmagoria, by avant-garde directors like Richard Maxwell, celebrated for his low-tech production. In his, in his play, called Ads, which has toured the world continuously since 2010, Maxwell replaces live actors with a video version of the Kinoplasticon 
similar to Tupac Shakur and Michael Jackson, at least technically. I show you a short excerpt as one speaker walks off of the raised platform and is replaced by another. You can sense their spectral comings and goings. The actor is going to just disappear on the left, and a new actor will uh, appear a few seconds later from the right. Remember that what we're seeing is just a glass plate onto which a video is projected. There are no actual people on stage. The lines are delivered in an unrehearsed, matter-of-fact manner characteristic of Maxwell's direction. But the actors are all ghosts. Previously recorded, they now deliver their lines via audio projected into the theater and video projected onto a slanted piece of glass on stage. Similarly, the phantasmagoric is an evidence in EJM 1 and 2. And this is uh, how it works. And this is what it looks like. A 1998 ballet staged by the now world-famous architectural duo Elizabeth Diller and Ricardo Scafidio. Uh, and it's, they've designed a museum for the, of, for, of sound and image, which is being erected right now on the beach at Copacabana. So just off the beach is a, a brand new museum of sound and image that they've designed. Uh, this ballet production from 1998 employed projection technology that quite nearly names its debt to the original Phantasmagoria, while at the same time turning it on its side. On a dark stage, dancers are accompanied by their video doubles, rear projected onto mobile vertical screens. One readily senses the presence of an additional body rather than the projection of a mere image. The occultation of production is complete. This is ecstatic phantasmagoria in the most literal senses of the term. And yet, as you've surely noted, the spectral figure, though projected erect, was clearly filmed lying down. He is, to borrow a phrase from Leo Steinberg, a rampant gisant, a reclining nude raised 90 degrees. Other manipulations further complicate the relationship between the live dancers and their vertically projected doubles. The entire exercise aligns the vertical screen, vertical human posture, and the verticality of gravity only to defy this verticality through media technology. This paltry sample could easily be multiplied many times over. What's more, much more can and should be said about each of these examples. But let me conclude with some speculations on the recent renaissance of phantasmagoria. That is, allow me to attempt to answer the question you've all, you all surely have been asking yourselves. Why phantasmagoria now? Technical expediency alone cannot explain the widespread adoption of phantasmagoric techniques across swaths of popular and avant-garde avant -garde culture. Rather than technical expediency, I would advance a media necessity. Millions of people still go to the cinema and visit museums. As an art and film historian, I hope they continue to do so for many decades. But the general cinification of everyday life ensures that the primary encounter with images no longer takes place in any one place. Not in the cinematic distance of the movie theater, nor within the enclosed objects of room spaces whether domestic TVs or museum artworks. Rather, our present is phantasmagoric, an assembly of images and people in the same time and space. Once a relatively marginal dispositif in the history of art, cinema, and theater, phantasmagoria appears to be swallowing ever greater swaths of our expanded cinematic environment. The popular resurgence of 3D and the introduction of high frame rates implant phantasmagoria into the traditional cinematic dispositif. More pervasively, the room space depicted in cinema as, as a haunted hotel, this is from an early 1903 film, that is replete with objects animated through stop motion and other techniques, these capitalist phantasmagorias where object commodities come alive are no longer a matter of trick cinematography and the cinema of attractions. Whether at home, at work, or on the move, we are pampered and besieged by devices that ring and vibrate 
speak and listen and know where we are and remind us what to do and respond to our commands, facilitate and carry out our virtual work, produce augmented and virtual realities, enable audiovisual communications, take and stream and play videos. In short, objects that stand on their heads and evolve out of their silicon brains, grotesque ideas far more wondrous than trick films or mere commodities ever dared. Here, in what was once room space, definite social relationships between humans assume the phantasmagoric form of relations between things. No longer content to look at images, we have assembled them as animated beings in our very world. Once marginal, phantasmagoria has emerged as a dominant because diffuse dispositif. A final word on methodology. A paradigm shift has been underway from the past, for the past 10 years or more. Previous generations asked ontological questions. They asked after the nature of painting, or more, or more recently, the nature of art. In film history and theory, André Bazin's famously asked, what is cinema? Since the 1980s, however, the pressing question for artists, filmmakers, historians, and theorists has not been what is cinema, but rather, as Chris Durkan brilliantly asserted over a decade ago, where is cinema? Over the past half hour, no, <laughs> hardly, over the past hour, I've argued that the what is often contingent on the where, that sight and function dictate ontology and render it provisional, a question ultimately of operation rather than of essence. I have argued that three dispositives were prevalent in the history of cinema, the cinematic, room space, and the phantasmagoric. These different dispositives combine specific technologies, specific aesthetic forms, and specific locations to affect specific relations between images and viewers. Each dispositif, I think this was where is cinema, each dispositif has been present throughout the history of cinema, but not necessarily in equal distribution. So allow me to conclude finally with a bit of speculation. I believe the end of the cinematic era is upon us and that its relocated futures lie in phantasmagoria. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take all questions, comments, positive, negative, um, preferably to the point, but as you wish. Okay. Let's try. Uh, Can we get this fixed? Okay. Well, uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Faço em português, então? Tá. Claro. Okay, I'm ready for Portuguese. Legal, posso então, obrigado. É muito interessante a, a conferência, obrigado. É, eu, eu, eu devo dizer que é, me surpreendeu, quer dizer, eu estou acostumado a, a ler sobre a fantasmagoria só como parte da pré-história do dispositivo cinemático. Então, tentar pensar um, o dispositivo fantasmagórico ao lado do dispositivo cinemático me, me, me surpreendeu bastante, é, é bastante ousado. Eu, eu devo admitir que eu ainda tenho uma certa dificuldade de, de perceber a, a consistência ontológica desse dispositivo. É, com perdão do trocadilho, o, o próprio dispositivo me parece fantasmagórico, quer dizer, como se ele tivesse latente na história do cinema e nunca tivesse aparecido claramente. É, em todos os exemplos do dispositivo, eu ainda senti uma relação muito forte com o cinemático, seja através do cinema, seja através é, é, do vídeo. A pergunta que eu tenho para o senhor é a seguinte. É, num dado momento, o senhor colocou que se bem me lembro, o senhor colocou que o, o próprio filme, só mais ou menos a partir de 1910, é, é, se tornaria uh, cinemático. Se é que eu entendi é, essa colocação. Eu, eu queria que o senhor explicasse isso melhor. 
É, a, além disso, eu, 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 eu não me pergunto se, se talvez a questão do dispositivo fantasmagórico não se torne mais clara exatamente a partir do momento em que as plataformas digitais uh, permitem a, a desmaterialização dos dispositivos, o que me parece uh, uh, vai de encontro à forma como o senhor descreveu esse dispositivo. Aí eu queria perguntar para o senhor se, se, se o senhor não acha que no cinema dos anos 70, 80 para cá, já existem alguns indícios disso. É, por exemplo, eu me lembrei daquele filme A Rosa Púrpura do Cairo, do Woody Allen, em que o personagem sai da tela é, e encontra a, a espectadora no cinema. É, me ocorreu também Rocky Horror Picture Show. Eu pergunto para o senhor se é um dispositivo, se não há aí uma combinação do cinemático com o que o senhor está chamando de Space Room, mais do que o... o, o o fantasmagórico, mas, de qualquer forma, me ocorreu isso. E, finalmente, eu queria saber como é que o senhor situa o atual cinema 3D, o cinema estereoscópico digital atual, dentro dessa questão, se ele já não, já não, já não apontaria para, para, essa, para essa superação do cinemático pelo fantasmagórico que o senhor uh, também me parece sugerir. É isso, obrigado. Um, thank you so much. So, I, uh, são três perguntas, na verdade. I had to run for my bag. I had to run for my bag, uh, for my bag uh, because there were so many good questions. Um, Obrigado. And to keep them straight. So you may have to remind me if I miss a question. Uh, the, uh, the first question, as I remember it, is, first of all, I, I appreciate your remark that the phantasmagory is traditionally in the archaeology or prehistory of cinema. And... I want to argue that there are separate strains that we need to flesh out. Um, so thank you for that recognition. Uh, I, I want to be crystal clear to the point of um, reducing my argument to one line right, about the phantasmagoric dispositif. The argument is in phantasmagoria, images and people occupy the same space. Now, that's manifest in many different ways because unlike cinema, no one medium became the dominant mode of phantasmagoria. Right. Um, but the definition, I think, is crystal clear. And it's one of these things where you know it as soon as you see it. Right? When you're in the same space as the image, it feels totally different than either the distance of cinema or the objecthood of, of room space. So, I, I, I think that the confusion or the uncertainty may be because the phantasmagoric can assume so many different forms and so many different conditions in art, in film, in theater, uh, in the 18th century, in the 21st century. And to be honest, I think there are incarnations of the phantasmagoric that sort of defy uh, the boundaries. So the more, that's the, this, that's the simple answer. The more complex answer is there are many hybrid forms. 3D cinema is clearly a conflation of the cinematic and the phantasmagoric. We have this absolute distance, and yet the image comes out into our space. I think it's part cinematic, part phantasmagoric. You asked a question, an exceptionally good question, about early cinema. Why did the cinematic arrive only in the 1910s, perhaps. And again, this is a polemical claim, but the argument uh, would be as follows. In the early days of cinema, the cinema addressed the spectator directly. To use the extreme but very famous example, Phantom Rides, and listen to the name. I didn't even think of this. The names were Phantom Rides. Phantom Rides were shot from the, from the head of, from the front of trains as the train was going through you know, tunnels and along tracks, you actually, Stan Douglas appropriated phantom ride footage in order to create overture. So you have these films shot from the front of trains, and uh, this one entrepreneur in 1906 named Hale, H-A-L-E, invented Hale's tours, and you would actually enter an old train car and the front of the train car was turned into a back projection cinema screen. So the image is back projected, just like the phantasmagoria. 
the, f the image, the, the, the film shown was called a phantom ride, and they actually put the, uh, the train on hydraulics so it bumped around, and you'd have this phantom experience of riding through the Swiss Alps or riding through the Rockies and through tunnels. Um, that is phantasmagoria. Right? That is the direct extension of your space into the cinematic space. Um, and again, it's still something of a hybrid, I would argue, but it's closer to phantasmagoria than to cinema. The style in, in, a, in a Georges Méliès film or an early cinema, you actually have people addressing the audience directly as if it were theater. Right? That direct address links your space and my space. It's more or less the same thing that I'm doing now. Right? We all occupy one space. Around 1906, 1907, according to Tom Gunning, the cinema of attractions, as this model is called, gives way to classical cinema, which takes about a decade to attain its normative form. By the late 19-teens, the rule, the number one rule of all acting is don't look at the camera. Don't break down the fourth wall. So at that point, there's the complete separation. The historian, uh, film historian and theorist Thomas Elsasser makes an incredible observation though. He says the style of acting was, didn't then create new, uh, new cinema auditoriums, new movie theaters. He says the beginning, the creation of specially built cinemas in the early 19-teens, the architecture actually changed the aesthetic form. So when cinemas, cinemas didn't exist, you just had old shops, right? Nickelodeons, old shops, uh, dime stores, uh, anywhere, uh, carnivals, anywhere, tents were, were used uh, to project cinema. Um, only in the 19, early 19-teens were purpose-built cinemas built. At that point, the separation, and, and, and this is crucial, and the model, the architectural model for these cinemas is Wagner's uh, Festspielhaus, Festival Theater. When Wagner's Festival Theater is combined with film, there you have the rise of the cinematic dispositif. But in the early days of cinema, I think it actually is closer to other things like phantasmagoria, um, and it's open to other directions. It's no surprise that today, if you go to uh, an amusement park, Disneyland, they put you in these virtual, uh, these virtual rides, and they project at 120 frames a second in super high def with hydraulics beneath you and take you into outer space, right, or in wherever, right, that that experience is very similar to Hale's tours in 1906, right. Phantasmagoria, I think, is making a comeback. In regard to your last question, does, is it only visible now with the digital? I think that dispositifs generally are now much more visible, right. It used to be the only place to see cinema was in the cinema, right? In French, there's no distinction between film and cinema, right? Pellicule does not define the, the medium. Cinema is cinema, right? Only, obviously, with television, that already began to split off, um, but only slowly. Today, uh, to, to think that a, a single place defines that cinema is linked exclusively to one place, I think is crazy. But my argument is that the cinematic goes back even before cinema, and the phantasmagoric continues long after. Right? So the, uh, is the dispositif more visible today, or all dispositifs more visible today than they were, I think, 30 years ago? Absolutely. Right? They've, be they've become standard, I think, in, in uh, critical discourse. The phantasmagoric, though, clearly has a very long history, and probably we could take it all the bit way back to antiquity, but that would be another story. But again. Um, hola. Hola. Tudo bem? É, obrigada, foi muito interessante a, a sua exposição. E, mas eu gostaria de retomar o final da sua palestra, quando você se pergunta onde está o cinema, e você fez uma breve menção sobre a natureza da arte, e eu fiquei também com essa pergunta. É, enfim, você faz um recorte né, das mídias e dos dispositivos, independente... Né, 
da, deles serem arte ou não. Então, eu fiquei é, me perguntando né, é, onde estaria a arte para você? Se ela também se tornou fantasmagórica. I, a great question. I think that uh, the cinematic doesn't care if it's Hitchcock or Spielberg or Wagner. Uh, room space doesn't care if it, you know, what crap you have on TV. You know, it could be Mad Men. It could be a Vito Acconci video piece. Um, it could be the, the nightly news. Um, The phantasmagoric doesn't distinguish between uh, theater, like fairground attractions like the phantasmagory or haunted houses, or what I would consider uh, really important works of art by, say, David Clairbout or Rodney Graham. Um, you could go to the theater and see really kitschy crap that uses phantasmagoric techniques, or you could see really interesting avant-garde productions by, say, the Worcester Group. Um, these I, to my mind, the idea that art has unique means is the only thing it succeeds in doing is it succeeds in separating art from the rest of life. And like a good avant-gardist, I believe we have to, we can never fuse art and life if we begin with the premise that art has unique means totally separate from the rest of life. We have to begin with the premise that the The, the dispositives that structure everyday images also structure art images. And then we have to ask, do art images do something different with this dispositif? Right. Is there a difference right, between uh, Tupac Shakur and Michael Jackson being resurrected on the one hand, and Robert Whitman and the Worcester Group and uh, and other phantasmagoric techniques on the other? My answer would be absolutely yes. Right? The difference is fundamental. But the difference is not because one people call themselves media entertainers and the other people call themselves artists. For me, the difference is what the works do, not what they're called. So re in regard to the ontological question, I say, pfft, you know, I think we need to throw out ontological questions. What is art is not the interesting question for me. The interesting question for me is, what does art do? It's a question not of essence, but of operation. Let me just add to that before the next question. I'm a big believer in art and artists, right? <laughs> This is what I study. It's what I spend all my time studying. I, I don't even find out about Tupac Shakur and Michael Jackson until someone tells me. I'll give a, you know, a lecture like this and say, oh, do you know Michael Jackson was just... I had no idea. Um, so fundamentally, my interest is in uh, avant-garde and, and, you know, and, and contemporary and historical art. But I think that the backdrop against which we have to judge contemporary art can't only be older art. I think we have to judge it against contemporary uh, media productions. And uh, that to me, it's that nexus of the, on one hand, the tradition of art, and on the other hand, all of the spectacles that are taking place around us. Um, I think that to me uh, makes the work not less interesting but more interesting. It makes the artwork not less important, but I hope more important. So I'm a big believer in art and artists and, and film and art film and avant-garde film. Um, at the same time, I believe we have to judge it in the context of other media spectacles going on today. Okay, I'm sorry, the question. Uh, é, parabéns pela lecture. É, eu tenho duas perguntas. A primeira é de respeito à própria definição do fantasmagórico, que você fala que tem esse compartilhamento entre a imagem e o corpo. É, e aí é, eu fiquei com uma dúvida, principalmente em relação aos trabalhos do Booster Group, porque nos trabalhos dele há esse compartilhamento entre imagem e corpo no palco, mas o público, ele, enfim, ele continua sendo o público. Então, na verdade, eu queria que você... É, refletisse sobre isso. E a segunda 
questão é de respeito, talvez eu acho que tenha, seja conectada à pergunta da Lívia, é, que, enfim, eu vi uma lecture sua sobre o antiquarian avant-garde. E eu queria saber se é, o, o seu interesse pelo, pela, pela fantasmagoria se relaciona com essa vanguarda de antiquário. Can you repeat the second question? É, a relação entre antiquarian avant-garde, é, uma lecture que você deu sobre o Christian Markley, e, e a utilização de e, e a fantasmagoria como um medium obsoleto. Ah, ok. Interesting questions, both. Um, the, uh, the thank you. The first question is essential, and it's really a mistake that I didn't specify it in the talk. In some instances, the link is between the Im the images and the audience. In other times, it's between the image and the actor. In the, in the uh, Dirksian phantasmagoria and Pepper's Ghost, the only uh, direct link are between the actors and the images. And interestingly, the actors don't even see the images. They have to memorize their movements to coordinate right, with the image. They can't see it because the image is just in front of them on the glass. Um, same thing applies to Tupac and Michael Jackson. So the, I try to specify this phantasmagoria doesn't always link the image to audience, but it always links images to human bodies. Sometimes it's spectators, sometimes it's viewers, sometimes it's actors, but always images and bodies are unified in the same space. Right? So in, the, in that instance, the actors are surrogate, we might say. Um, the, uh, is that clear? I mean, your question's exactly right, but I believe that in either case, we have a fusion of art, of, of images and bodies. Sometimes it's in the single space of a gallery, sometimes it's in the single space of the stage. Uh, the second question is a question about obsolescence. Uh, and it's, uh, there's been a lot of interesting theoretical work, especially Rosalind Krauss uh, developing Walter Benjamin's idea, idea of obsolescence, and that obsolete media can be resurrected with new critical potential. And as I understand it, the question was, is this resurrection of phantasmagoria a similar type of uh, technique of using an obsolete technology to gain critical potential in the present. It's an interesting thought. I'm not certain. My instinct is that everyone's resurrecting phantasmagoria. You know, Apple is resurrecting phantasmagoria. Michael Jackson is resurrecting phantasmagoria. Um, you know, so, and you know, Hollywood and Las Vegas, is, are, they're all resurrecting phantasmagoria. So my suspicion is that this is uh, not the avant-garde taking something outmoded and making it radical, but rather an avant-garde that in the 60s and 70s was a bit ahead of its time and today is in lockstep with its time, uh, trying to negotiate the contours of mediated reality. Um, so my sense is this is not an instance of uh, the revolutionary, uh, Benjamin called it the revolutionary nihilism of the outmoded. I think that phantom phantasmagoria is more alive today than in any other moment in history. Um, but those are both excellent questions, like the last question about art. É, boa noite. Então, eu poderia é, considerar a, fantasma, a fantasmagoria, um recurso da diegese, da obra? Of who? Como um recurso da diegese, da obra? A, fantasma, a fantasmagoria? I, I'm missing the key word. Who, of who? Diegese? Sim. Sí. I don't know diegese. Sim. 
Então, a diegés é um estrupo de linguagem cinematográfica que é o mundo fictício da narração, né? o mundo fictício dessa relação do, da obra com o espectador. E como a fantasmagoria tem um rec esse recurso do, né, do, do vírus, do espelho, faz com que o, o corpo presente ele seja projetado, e isso envolve o mundo fictício, a, a narrativa da obra. Né? Enfim, aí eu fiquei pensando se ela seria uma... <coughs> O, a fantasmagoria, um recurso da diegese. Can anyone, can you explain to me what diegese is? Diegese, pelo que a partir do que eu conheço, não é um termo da linguagem. Oh, diegesis? Diegesis. Diegesis. Yes. Ah. É da narratologia, não é, não é da... Eu vou dizer, diegesis sounds so much better than diegesis. I, I wish I could call it diegesis. Okay. I would be so much happier, and my students would be so much happier if I could call it diegesis. Ok. Diegesis. Um, interestingly, Uh, part of the argument uh, about the early cinema is that when it is, is a shift from mimesis to diegesis, uh, from showing to telling. And in the early cinema, things were shown at you directly, and that was more phantasmagoric. When diegesis begins, it in almost always tells a, wor tells a story of a world closed to itself. Right? So everything that happens, happens inside. Now, the, the example was brought up in the very first question of the Purple Rose of Cairo uh, from 1986. I, uh, I think it's a very interesting, uh, I, I reference it in another piece actually on Stan Douglas. The earlier example is, um, is Buster Keaton uh, in 1929. Um, he does 1926. Anyway, in the late 20s, uh, he does the same basic trick and he does it even more magnificently. What's interesting is when Buster Keaton does it, uh, he, when he enters the cinema, and this, the same thing happens with when, when uh, Woody Allen does it, there's an amazing sequence when someone comes out in the cinema and crosses the th threshold of the screen, but once Woody Allen or once Buster Keaton enters the screen, enters the cinema, then the movie theater disappears and we're suddenly again in a world totally separate from us. So the key is that in those movies, they actually are an allegory, not of the phantasmagoric, but of the cinematic, of the absolute distance that separates cinema stories from phantasmagoric stories. So in early, in, uh, in early cinema, the address is direct, right? The, the address is right at you, just like I'm here, right? Except, you know, they'd be much more entertaining. Um, the, uh, And that is showing, it's mimesis. Diegesis, or telling, is a telling that invariably happens behind a fourth wall that we pretend doesn't exist. It's the telling that always happens at a distance. So to my mind, diegesis usually separates off, right? The, 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 uh, the story now doesn't take place between the actor and the audience, but rather between the actors and each other, between actors and other actors. So they, have one space that is theirs, and we have one space that's ours. That's diegesis. In my mesis, uh, it's a direct address. I'm showing you something. It's like the slides that I show you here, right? They don't really belong to another space. They belong to the space of the auditorium. So I'm not sure that we can map my mesis and diegesis absolutely on phantasmagoric and cinematic, but on the whole, I think diegesis tends to represent a separate world rather than the world we inhabit. And thank you again for that wonderful pronunciation. <laughs> Does that answer, is that, is that an acceptable answer? Okay. Obrigada pela é, ótima lecture. Eu queria fazer uma pergunta. Dentro do seu conceito de fantasmagoria, é, você não citou o Michael Snow. Você consideraria a produção dele como um, uma, 
um, alguma, um artista importante para desenvolver esse conceito, porque o Wavelength é muito próximo do que você teria desenvolvido como fantasmagoria. My short answer is yes. Um, for some obviously foolish reason, I uh, cut out my Michael Snow slide and description before I left New York. Um, I, uh, the answer is Michael Snow is another great instance of this. Um, I think he's flirts with the cinematic and the phantasmagoric and room space. And he is, uh, I think there's some incredible instances. Like he, there are few artists who actually move between these dispositives as compellingly as Michael Snow. So I think he absolutely belongs in this discussion. I've had him in and foolishly took him out. But I think it's very, the, when you really apply pressure, where is Michael Snow cinematic? And at times he's very cinematic. Where is he phantasmagoric? Where is he, where is it room space? And where does he fuse them or move between them? These are, I think, very interesting questions. So we could discuss it perhaps further on, but my short answer again is yes. É, então, é, eu, eu tenho uma última pergunta para o senhor, que é, que é relativa à a, a seguinte questão. É, em alguns pontos da, da conferência, o senhor criticou a visão enfim, mais tradicional que se tem das fantasmagorias ligada à crítica marxista. É, por outro lado, não me parece que a, a descrição arqueológica do, do dispositivo fantasmagoria em si contradiz essa crítica. Quer dizer, é, 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 não, não se trata aqui exatamente de, é, de uma valorização positiva ou negativa é, 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 do fantasma agórico, embora a maior parte da crítica marxista tenha um, um viés marcadamente negativo, mas se trata de pensar que, se o dispositivo fantasmagórico, de certa forma, está se tornando cada vez mais importante para entender a nossa sociedade, e se, de qualquer forma, há um objetivo crítico na compreensão desses dispositivos devido às implicações políticas, culturais, econômicas, que, que, que o desenvolvimento desses dispositivos evidentemente tem sobre a sociedade... Me parece que essa constatação da importância desse dispositivo, na verdade, confirma a, a, a ideia marxista do fetichismo das mercadorias, que, enfim, na nossa sociedade, na sociedade capitalista, continua ou continuaria, se a gente concordar com essa teoria, vigente. Então, eu queria que o senhor falasse um pouquinho melhor sobre essa questão da crítica à, à, à visão tradicionalmente marxista do, da fantasmagoria. Yeah, it's another great question. The, um, Marx didn't use the term, he didn't invent the term phantasmagoria, obviously, and he didn't use the term very widely. He uses it to describe uh, uh, the, the commodity and replacing relations between people with relations between things. That he calls phantasmagoric. In the, famously, in the English language, ver, uh, initial English translation, they translate it as fantastic instead of phantasmagoric, but the word is phantasmagorish. Um, the, uh, I think there's tremendous truth in that, and uh, I wasn't interested in, and I'm not interested in revising that, uh, which maybe even pushing it forward a little bit further, though it remains a very powerful, very strong critique, and fundamentally I, I adhere to it. Uh, where, where I'm trying to uh, shift the debate is in certain Marxist critics, and here it's the tradition of Adorno, say, um, but you have certain critical theory or reception of it to the present in which um, any high production spectacle is definitionally bad because it doesn't show you how it's made. And anything that shows you how it's made is at least probably pretty good, 
or is at least a step in the right direction. Now, Adorno never ever would adhere to something that simplistic. But I fear that we have plenty of examples, especially in regard to uh, film and video, in which works are praised because we can see the projector, or we can see the celluloid, or we know how it's made, that this somehow makes it uh, a critical work. In fact, Adorno said specifically about, um, uh, about the culture industry, it's genius is that it fools us even though we know how it works. Right? The commodity fetish, we know that the advertising is just the same old crap, but we buy it anyway. Right? Um, so that's what I want to push away from. I think that there are uh, plenty, there are plenty, and this is also, this is a completely separate lecture, but I think an interesting one, but I'll refer to it now. Where do we see endless self-referential uh, episodes? So we see it in certain avant-garde strains, but much, much more frequently, we see it in, in, in humor, in comedy, in slapstick comedy. We see it in advertising, right, where they reference the fact that they're advertising it, or screwball comedies when uh, you see that they're making a movie while they're making the movie, right? That's not critical, right? That's entertainment. Um, so what I want to do away with is the idea that revealing the apparatus tells you anything at all. Most spectators in the original Phantasmagoria knew it was just entertainment. Right? So there's a third term, which is wonder. Wonder is, I know that it's a trick, but I find it wondrous anyway. Right? I, don't, I don't mistake it for reality. I'm not fooled that this is reality, but I still find it remarkable. Now, for Adorno, I think wonder was a bad thing. I'm not so sure it's a bad thing. I think that some great artists, present and certainly past, have mobilized wonder toward very compelling aesthetic and even critical ends. Right? Um, so it's that strain of Marxist ideology critique that I think we need to move past. And I, I point to it because the term dispositif, as you probably know, owes a great debt to Jean-Louis Baudry in his 1970 and 1975 essays, the second one called Le Dispositif. Um, and that model of ideology critique, I'm not interested in. Um, so we need to know, uh, I think, and I think in a much more Foucauldian vein, right, power relations aren't good or bad. They are. They can be used for good or they can be used for bad. And I don't think dispositifs are good or bad. The cinematic dispositif isn't good or bad. The phantasmagoric dispositif isn't good or bad. I think you know, we can have great films and critical films, and we can have schlock and terrible and ideologically retrograde films. The dispositif, right, most people, and, Wag and here, and here uh, Adorno is definitely guilty, most people dismiss Wagner because of the whole Wagnerian enterprise. It's automatically bad because it's Gesamtkunstwerk. I don't think so. Right? I mean, I think the world divides into two, the people who love Wagner and the people who hate them. I love Wagner. Um, the, uh, I think fundamentally the dispositif has no positive or negative valence. I think the overwhelming tendency is for these dispositifs, like everything else, to be used to suppress and oppress people and to take advantage of them. That's the world we live in. The question isn't whether these can be used for nefarious ends, which they inevitably will. The question is what paths of resistance are available to us? And my hope is that by naming the phantasmagoric as a distinct dispositif, we'll be able to identify new paths of resistance that were not available to us previously. Posso fazer mais uma só? Última. Última pergunta. O, a famosa exibição do, da chegada do trem na estação dos irmãos Lumière, em 1895, a, a história de que os espectadores teriam se assustado com a perspectiva do trem uh, 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 chegando em, na, na, na direção do, do espectador, né? na, na direção da tela, é, isso seria, tendo em mente o que o senhor colocou sobre o 
o cinema dos inícios não ser necessariamente um dispositivo cinemático, ser um dispositivo ainda aberto a outras possibilidades. Essa história, mesmo que ela seja uma fantasia, mesmo que ela seja anedótica, ela é um testemunho da força do, do, do cinematógrafo como dispositivo cinemático ou fantasmagórico? I love these questions. I, I, I wrote an article in October on Stan Douglas, an overture, and I tackle every, like, each of these uh, train references. So as you know, uh, the story of uh, the train arriving at the station at the first film screening and everybody runs out of the, th of the theater because they're afraid of the train never happened. The film wasn't shot until 1896. You know, a few months after the 1895, the December 28th, 1895 screening. Even when it was screened, audiences might have been afraid, but there's no account of anyone actually running out. What's amazing, though, is that in 1902, a number of different film directors start making film versions of the story. <laughs> so you have uh, Uncle Josh. Uncle Josh is like the idiot from the country. Okay. Uncle Josh at the cinema, you see a number of different films, and one of which, the last of which, or no, the second to last of which, is a train arriving, and the idiot Uncle Josh runs out. So in 1902, the myth is already so strong that people are making film versions of the story that never happened. Right. To me, Uncle Josh in one space, thinking that the, fan that the train is coming at him and running out is pure phantasmagoria. Here's my proof. That's the second film in the Edison version. The third film is of a woman doing the can-can dance. He, of course, falls in love with this woman immediately, Uncle Josh, thinks the woman is real, and then when a man comes to take her away, attacks the man, and of course, doesn't touch the man, but tears down, tears down the screen, revealing a film projectionist from behind, which never would have been the case in a real theater. Right? So the, the, this film operator from behind, the thinking that the woman was in the actual space, that's basically Robert Whitman's shower. Right? And that's basically Robertson's phantasmagoria. So I think if any uh, myth confirms the phantasmagoric status of early cinema, it's definitely the arrival of the train. Yeah. Thank you. Alguma última questão? Tadeu, vamos encerrar então? I have to say, it's been a full two hours, and I appreciate enormously uh, your patience uh, and your extremely thoughtful questions. This was a very productive uh, conversation for me. So thank you very much. Okay.